think of it. I'm freaking out. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> so when they announced that you were coming, the first thing I was like, for the love of God, can I please moderate Weird Al? I have listened to you since I was this high with my brother in the back of a car driving on road trips. So sorry. Oh no, I'm not. I don't need apologies, it was fantastic. Um, my first question is, in 2013, a very great company came back on it, online, which was called Orion. What I want to know is when we are getting UHF 2. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's very nice. I get a lot of uh, questions like that, and um, I appreciate the support and the, the love for, uh, for UHF. I, I don't think there's going to be uh, any kind of sequel. I, I, I think that a lot of major motion picture studios don't like to make sequels to movies that bombed 30 years ago at the box office. <laughs> it's not the high on their list, so, uh, I, but I appreciate it. And also, comedy sequels in general, you know, tend to be disappointing, and I don't want to disappoint people. I'd rather people have their fond memories and their nostalgia. I don't know, make a good two and a half was all right, but, you know. That's true. <laughs> um, I was reading all about you yesterday, and one of the things that made me laugh was that your parents chose an accordion for you. And I'm curious, what was the first thought when they put it on the table and said, this one? Well, I think that they, they wanted me to be a sex symbol. And, uh, they, uh, they just knew that if I played the accordion, I'd be super popular in high school. Um, I'm, what I'm also curious too is like, what is the general process of when you parody a song? Are you driving in your car and hearing it on the radio and going, and like you just pull over and say, I gotta think of something. Or do people come to you and offer it? Well, <laughs> if people do try to give me their ideas and I try to discourage that because I've got more than enough voices in my head already uh, <laughs> telling me what to do. Uh, it's, sort of, it's sort of the bane of my existence. I'll go up in the supermarket shopping for, you know, for carrots and like, oh, I've got this great idea that I've had since the third grade and I if I ever meet Weird Al in public, I have to tell them about it. Uh, but no, I, I, you know, sometimes I'm in my car, uh, most of my ideas actually come in the middle of the night, for some reason, I don't know what it is, I think, I think, you know, the, my Twitter feed has slowed down, nobody's calling on the phone, my family's asleep, and, uh, I, I think when you're a little bit tired, that's when the really bizarre ideas start creeping in, so I, most of my, most of my songs are written between like 2 and 4 in the morning. In, in your point, this career, are, do celebrities ever come up to you and say, will you please do this, uh, a parody of my song? Like, I, I, I have heard that, I'm not sure if they're being genuine or if they're just trying to make conversation. Uh, but, and I won't mention any names, but uh, on occasion I've had people come up to me at a, at a party or, or uh, uh, an event and say, when are you going to do one of my songs? <laughs> In that voice, when are you going to do one of my songs? <laughs> ah, see, <laughs> Um, I, I'm a huge lover of audience. Okay, we got a line coming up, so we'll get to you guys in just a second. Um, I'm going to ask you a question. I ask every celebrity this question. It's my favorite question because I think it tells a lot about a person. What is your go-to karaoke song? <laughs> and it can't be one of your real ones. That's cheap. Well, I, I, I'm going to kind of avoid that question because I, I actually tend to avoid karaoke bars like The Plague. I'm out. Just because, well, the, the thing is, it's not because they don't like it, it's, it's just because like when I first started out, a lot of critics that didn't like me, if they were like trying to say something nasty, they, they'd call me a, a glorified karaoke act. So, and that always kind of, kind of stung a little bit, so I, I tend not to like go, although I love doing cover versions, I, I did a... I did George Fest uh, a, a couple of years ago and got to do uh, What Is Life with a band, and I, I, like, I like doing straight cover versions of the thing, because that's a lot of fun. Awesome. Uh, but I, yeah, I tend not to get dragged to karaoke bars so much. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll go to our first question over here. I'm going to back up so you can actually see him, because I feel like I'm blocking you. Ah, there we go. 
Oh, you're in the front! Never mind. Well, I'm an idiot. I was wondering, will you ever think about doing any more comedy movies or TV shows? Yeah, hopefully so. I mean, uh, I, I am not really out doing any more movies. Uh, and I, I'm uh, doing a, a couple cameos, which I'm not allowed to talk about yet, but at least one is going to be, uh, I think, going to be next month in some movie coming out. Um, and, and various other TV show projects. Uh, uh, I'm at my little Murphy's Law right now. Two other things. Unfortunately, most of the stuff that I'm going to be in or involved with, I, I'm not at liberty to talk about, but uh, I'm, I'm doing stuff which you'll find out about at some point in the future. <laughs> the next one. Okay. Um, can I call you out? You may. All right. So, out. Um, but here's the question. So, all of this stuff, all your music career, your movie career, all of these shows. What was the tipping point? What was the thing that made you want to go? That's what I want to do in life. I didn't realize this is what I wanted to do for a living till about till like last month. <laughs> It's been a long time coming. I, I think I think this is really going to be my chosen profession. I think I, this is going to be it. Um, no, I, I, I guess to be serious, I, I, I think <laughs> there, there wasn't really one particular moment. Although what sticks in my mind is when I quit my day job uh, because I signed my record deal in 1982, uh, and at the time it wasn't like here's a big pile of money. Congratulations, you're a rock star. It wasn't quite like that. It was sort of like okay, you, you are now contractually bound to us for infinity, and good luck, and if you make any money, then we'll pay you somewhere down the road. So, I had this record deal, and I was, I had put out an album, uh, but I was still living in, in this, like, $300 a month apartment with a Murphy bed that folded out from the wall. You know, it was, you know, it was not, I, I wasn't living the high life. Uh, and I was still working in a mailroom for literally minimum wage. Uh, but part of my job was I had to go to the, the, the post office every morning and pick up the mail, and there was a Billboard magazine sticking out of the bag, and I, I opened it up and looked on the chart, and I, my, my single was on the Hot 100 chart. And I was thinking, I should probably give notice of work, and uh, you know, maybe get serious about this weird owl thing. So that was, that was probably, if there was one tipping point, that was probably it. How's it going? Hey, how you doing? Hey, um, so you have a, an amazing song about the Jungle Cruise at Disneyland, and, and at your concerts you sang Grim Grinning Ghosts. So I was just wondering what your favorite Disneyland attraction is and why. Oh, well, honestly, it's probably Space Mountain, just because Woo! I like that. And uh, my, my daughter wasn't into roller coasters when she was smaller, and, and she's getting into them now, so I'm looking forward to going back and riding Space Mountain with her until she pukes. <laughs> I've got a question for you. Being that this is Comic Con, we're all geeks here, and you have one of the greatest Star Wars songs of all time. The saga begins. Now, it's rumored, and I'm curious if you can confirm it or not, that when you did this, they did not tell you any part to the script, and so you had to just, I assume, research? Uh, spoilers? How'd you do it? Oh, I just went online. Uh, there are a lot of spoilers out about the movie. I did not see it. Uh, I did not have uh, access to a script or anything like that. But but based on all the uh, uh, rumors and spoilers of the Star Wars websites, I was able to piece together more or less the plot of the movie and write the parody based on that. Uh, and I will say that I did uh, pay money and go to a, a charity advanced screening of the movie uh, just to make sure that you know. The internet <laughs> wasn't being, you know, <laughs> tricky. Uh, it never is. Yeah. I always trust the internet. But it, it, it was uh, actually pretty darn accurate. I, I might have changed a word or two, but basically the plot was correct, and uh, and I was able to put out the song and get it out in a timely, timely fashion. All right. Next question. What is the worst car you've ever owned? The worst car I ever owned? Uh, well, I, I don't want to cast shade on Toyota, but I owned a Corolla around 1982 to 84. And it was, not that it was a bad car, but it was a used car. And I just remember 
uh, whenever it went more than 40 miles an hour, it would go. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go with that one. It's the greatest noise ever. Next question. Uh, um, I was just wondering if there was a song that's out right now that you um, have like come up with ideas for that you'd be interested in parodying. Yeah, I mean, there, there are things out right now that uh, definitely are candidates and potential uh, targets, uh, but uh, I'm not, at, again, not on the ready to discuss that because I, I like it to be surprised when the Brady comes out. Uh, so, I mean, anything that's at the top of the charts is always, you know, a, a potential target. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Al. My name's Ryan. Great to meet you. You too? Yes, yeah, so I'm an art snob who loves to delve into the process of my favorite artists. So, how exactly do you go about parodying or doing a polka of a song, and how does collaboration with fellow artists help you get that work out there? How does collaboration with other artists? Yeah. Uh, well, there's not a lot of collaboration other than the music is already written. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, like, for when I signed my contract for, for Eat It back in 1984, it was, like, written by Al Yankovic and Michael Jackson. So, <laughs> But it wasn't like we sat in the room together going, well, Michael, what do you think about this line? It wasn't quite like that. Um, but I mean, every, every song is a little different, and uh, you know, I, I, uh, I can either write a song very quickly or spend a lot of time getting the ideas together. But uh, back in the early days, like in the early 80s, I would write things very quickly because I thought that it had, everything had a short uh, shelf life, and, and you know, maybe I get some play on the Dr. Demento show, and that was it. And, uh, yeah. And after a while, after you know a while, I realized like these songs are like hanging on, and, and uh, you know I, I didn't realize back then that if I wrote a song, I'd be playing it on stage 30 or 40 years later. So, so nowadays, I spend a lot of time really kind of crafting the lyrics and making sure they're they're as good as they can be. This is a, from a story that I've heard like bits and pieces of, so I was curious if you could elaborate more on it. And nothing to disparage the man, God to keep him. But why were you not allowed to look Prince in the eye? Um, okay, he's referring to um, a telegram that I got uh, a couple days before. I think it was the American Music Awards, and sometime in the late '80s, I got a telegram uh, to my manager's office saying that that I was going to be sitting in the same row as Prince during the award show. And I was not I was not to establish eye contact with him at any point during the show. <laughs> and I thought this was some kind of personal slam. Then I was talking to some guys from Night Ranger and they got the same telegram. Like everybody in the immediate vicinity of Prince got this telegram not to establish eye contact, which is very odd, I thought. And I'll tell you, I didn't tell anybody with the Prince camp, but a couple times during the show I did look at him. <laughs> Right in the eyes. <laughs> and you didn't turn to stone. Nope. Awesome. <laughs> Next question. So, what's your favorite song that you've written and why? Oh, my favorite song that I what? Your favorite song that you wrote. Of my own or? Of your own. Uh, it's hard to pick it. It always changes. Uh, I, I tend to, to like the newer things. Um, and I, I love the parodies, uh, but I, I feel uh, kind of close to the deep cuts because I spend more time working on those. Like on the last album, uh, the last song, Jackson Park Express, was a song that I liked a lot. Uh, it's like a nine minute song, uh, sort of sort of a Cat Stevens kind of pastiche. It's kind of like a mid-70s singer-songwriter kind of vibe. And uh, it, it just, uh, it was something that I spent a lot of time working on with Brett of Production. It's a song that not a lot of the general population would even be aware about, but uh, it's, that's, that's just one example of, you know, I, it's, it's hard for me to, they're like my children, I can't pick. <laughs> I have a question real fast. I don't, I don't know how many, I'm trying to hear my applause. Uh, who has seen him live? He's seen me live right now. That's true. Let's out the accordion, let's do this. <laughs> So, I've seen you live, you do more costume changes than Janet Jackson, which is fantastic. Um, but what you also do is... Where's the nip slips, too? <laughs> which is sexier, too. Um, 
Uh, well, all you have is a lot of extras on your stage. And I've heard that you work with local cosplayers. What were the 501st? The 501st. Were there any 501st people out there? <laughs> yeah, and so I just want to know, like, how, how did that incorporate? How did you get in touch with them? Like, you know, how excited were they to join you? Because they should be very... I'm trying to remember how it started. I think somebody, some guy from the 501st uh, approached me somewhere in public and just said, hey, and he explained what the, the, the organization was, and said, if you ever want anybody on stage with you in costume for your Star Wars songs, let us know. And I think they probably took his email or something and gave it to my manager. And they came to a few shows and it turned out great. And, and they've been doing it for, I don't know how many years now, but uh, you know, 10, 15, maybe 20 years. But they've been uh, on stage. Everywhere that I go, we get local 501st members out on stage with us to dress the Stormtroopers and Darth Vader. And they have a great time and it makes the show 20 times better. So I'm thankful for all the 501st people out there. Yeah. If you've not seen them live, oh my god. Buy a ticket, it's fantastic. Next question. Hello. So, you're known for doing a lot of guest appearances on TV shows. So, what was it about Milo Murphy's Law that made you commit to doing a longer run? Well, I, I you know, I, I love doing voiceover work for one thing, and uh, it was really, I, I jumped at the chance to work with uh, Jeff Swampy Marsh and Dan Poven. <laughs> Uh, I'm a big Phineas and Ferb fan, and the, when I heard they were doing a new show, uh, I was very interested. And the character of Milo Murphy, uh, I thought I would be right for, and they certainly did. They, they, I wasn't aware of this, but I found out after the fact that they they uh, auditioned hundreds of people for that part, and they couldn't find anybody that, that, that had the right kind of kind of vibe. They were looking for somebody that was just sort of like naturally optimistic, and they they said, "Well, we should get Weird Al," and I said, "Well, yes, you should." <laughs> It's just a blast. I mean, every time I go to do a, a voiceover session, uh, I, I just have the best time. I'm always sad when it's over. Like, <laughs> every session is somebody saying, what, that's it? You don't want any more? Uh, it's just really fun. They, they, they just, uh, they're, they're, they're just brilliant. They're funny. Uh, everything they give me, I know that the writing is going to be top notch. Um, and it's, it's just always really gratifying to work on a quality project and work, work with amazing people. So, I mean, what's not to like? They're really great people. They probably made those cupcake that particular episode a little stranger because I was on it. Uh, I, I had to explain that I was vegetarian, so I, I wasn't going to eat the squid cupcake. Uh, but other than that, that was, that was sort of the, their idea. I didn't have a whole lot of input. They, that was that was all on them. So, uh, also a follow-up question on that: um, What was your favorite part of being in Cupcake Wars? Well, I like cupcakes. <laughs> Yeah, hey, any, time, any chance for free cupcakes, I'm there. <laughs> oh, this guy looks good. Hey, hello! Um, my question was, uh, how did asking permission to do songs kind of transition for you from earlier in your career to later in your career? Well, it's gotten a lot easier. I mean, at the very beginning, like uh, before I had a record deal, I didn't even bother asking permission because they didn't know that was a thing. You know, when I, when, when I recorded stuff in my bedroom, you know, I didn't think, oh, I should ask Queen if this is okay. You know, it never occurred to me. And then when I found out that they were finding out of it, going, going like, what's this kid doing? Then I realized I should probably get their permission. And then in the beginning, it was a bit difficult because I didn't have a track record when I first started out. I mean, uh, you know, my, my manager had a tough time getting his phone calls returned because nobody knew who, knew who this weird Al kid was. Um, and it was, uh, Michael Jackson actually really kind of was a, a, a tipping point in a way because when he gave him his permission for Eat It, uh, all of a sudden we had some ammunition in our back pocket. Then anybody else that was sort of waffling or not sure, we could go back and say, well, you know, Michael Jackson didn't seem to have a problem. <laughs>
my personal taste. I just kind of like like loud clothing and, and bright colors, and it's just I've always enjoyed it. Uh, my wife has gotten me to, to dress down a bit more in public. <laughs> you know? I figured I'd be okay wearing it to a con like this, but uh, <laughs> when I step out of the house, normally it's like, could you wear like a brown shirt or maybe <laughs> something beige? Uh, but it's something that I've always liked. In fact, uh, my collection. Uh, uh, got exponentially larger sometime in the mid-80s. I, I figured, you know, all these rock bands, these touring bands, always have some ridiculous thing on their on their rider, you know, because backstage they have to give you whatever you ask for within reason. And I said, okay, I'm going to have one stupid demand. So I said, for every show I do on this tour, the promoter has to give me one horrible Hawaiian shirt. <laughs> and we did... That, that, we did like hundreds of shows on that tour, so I wound up with hundreds of Hawaiian shirts. And that, was like, that was sort of the beginning of it. Um, so I got a question. Throughout your career, has there ever been a song that you say, mm, I probably shouldn't touch that one? Oh, because it would be like improper? Or, no, or just off limits or too important? Or... Yeah, I mean, it's very rarely. I mean, sometimes, uh, you know, it, it feels just a little bit too sensitive or like it would, it, it just wouldn't feel right. Like, you know, uh, off the top of my head, you wouldn't want to do a Tears in Heaven parody, per se. You know, that, that kind of thing. You just have to pick your moments as to what would be appropriate. Yeah, that's probably true. <laughs> See, here they go. Next question. Hey, Al. Hello. Um, so, in UHF and in some of your work, um, we see you eat a lot of obscure things like that have to do with cheese. So I'm wondering when we can expect the Obscure Recipes book by Weird Al Yankovic. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to try all of them. It turns out that I'll have to uh, solicit a book deal now. We'll see about that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I remember one time long ago I contributed uh, my recipe for peanut butter and jelly sandwich to a uh, to a rock and roll cookbook, but that, that's the only thing so far. But uh, yeah, it's good to know. Most most of the recipes that I did on Al TV are not really fit for human consumption. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I might. I, yeah, if, if those got included in a book, there'd probably have to be be a big warning sticker: Do not actually make this food. <laughs> Is there a vegetarian version to the Twinkie Wiener sandwich? Yeah! Do they have ve vegetarian Twinkies? I'm not sure. Okay. I don't know. The vegan Twinkie, I don't know. Well, that's... <laughs> Speaking of do not consume. No. <laughs> we were talking about how you, your parents presented you with the accordion. Did you also do that to your daughter? Come, day, come home one day with an instrument and present it to her and make her start taking lessons? You know, my, my daughter has had a number of instruments in the house. My drummer, Bermuda, actually gifted her with a, a small drum set when she was very, very little. And thankfully, she didn't really take to that. Uh, and, and, uh, and she had a guitar in the house uh, and didn't really take to that. And then when she was about 12 years old, she actually asked me uh, for accordion lessons. Which I, I promise I did not force it on her. That was her own thing. We got her a little, uh, little student model, a little 12 bass student model. And I, I gave her some lessons. She learned um, some Christmas songs, so she she can play a few things. And then she, you know, kind of got bored and, and onto other things. And she just uh, we just got a nice new uh, bass guitar from Fender. They just gave us a nice uh, a, a bass and an amp. So she, maybe she'll be onto that now. So she every couple of years she gets an interest in something new. So, I've been lucky enough to meet a few rock stars. I'm wondering how you've been able to, uh, to keep all the women off, but, but really how you've been able to maintain family values considering you're a celebrity. It's, it's never been a huge problem to keep the woman away from me, I don't know. It uh, hasn't been a huge battle in my life. Uh, and I, I've been happily married for 16 years now, so that's... Uh, Okay. Um, hi, I was wondering, what was your initial reaction when you got the call saying that you were going to be on My Little Pony? Woo! 
I just felt very happy about it. I mean, you know, I, I, I like I said before, I, I love doing voiceover work, and uh, it's, it's one of my favorite things that I do. And uh, I, I you know, it's, but usually they call me in for a session, and it's a quick job, and and uh, it's a cameo appearance. And, and and the fact that I was able to, you know, have a a, a uh, you know a job that was going to be around for a while. Uh, and to, to be a, a star of a series like that, and to work with those people. And we just got picked up for the second season, which I'm very happy about as well. So that was all very exciting. Uh, hi. Uh, I wanted to ask you, what question do you wish people would ask you? Uh, would you like this big pile of money? <laughs> One of my favorite things about your career are your album covers. I think they're fantastic, and I think the, the parody of Nirvana's Nevermind. Uh, oh, so cool. um, <laughs> do you have a favorite of your own album cover? Um, hard to say. I, maybe uh, Alpocalypse, which is uh, Robin Van Slyne is a photographer, and I, I just like the idea of the, you know, this like kind of heavy metal album cover with the four horsemen and looking really serious and hardcore and they're like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> I thought that was a nice little juxtaposition. Hello. Oh. How's it going, Mr. Yankovic? Yeah, how you doing? Good. Um, I, my question is, uh, you're a goofy guy, which is great. Thank you. the world a better place. If you ever feel the need to be serious creatively, what outlets do you use to do some more serious artistic. I think there are enough people that do serious things. I don't know. I don't have a. I don't have any kind of burning desire. I mean, I, I could do like just straight music, um, but that, that's you know. I, I I found out when I was a teenager when I tried to write straight uh, lyrics, it always wound up warped somehow because my brain was just wired that way. So I, I just never. I never had any kind of compulsion. I, I know a lot of people uh, that, that do novelty music, they, they look at it as a way to get their foot in the door, like, oh, I've made it a big impression, and I've got this, this wacky hit, now here's my real art. And uh, this is my real art. I, I don't have any kind of pretension. Songs over the years, and this was probably a bit more of a main spirit one. But what was your least favorite one to do? <laughs> a least favorite song? Um, I I'm, I'm going to say, and this is nothing uh, nothing uh, against Cindy Lauper certainly, but I was forced by my record label to do "Girls Just Want to Have Lunch" <laughs> uh, because uh, I, I had "Dare to Be Stupid" the album pretty much in the can, and I had like a surgeon, which I thought was, okay, this is the first single. My record label was like, nah, you need a Cindy Lauper parody on the album. I was like, I think this Madonna thing is gonna do okay. And they said, well, if you don't do a Cindy Lauper parody, we're not putting on the album. So it was, I did this show under, I did that song under duress, uh, but you might be able to hear the tone of my voice when I'm singing. <laughs> Jumping on that question, what song did you hear and immediately thought, I, you know, you knew the parody that was going to be? <laughs> that doesn't happen too often. Usually, I, I have to think a lot about something, and I look at all the variations and all the uh, alternatives and options and narrow it down. And I'm very like super analytical about it. But I remember uh, when I saw the bad video on TV for the first time. Before the video was even over, I knew that I was going to do fat. <laughs> but, uh, I just didn't want, I just, I, I could imagine like, you know, uh, a five, 800 pound version of Michael Jackson trying to get through the subway, you know, <laughs> turnstile, and I thought, okay, I'm doing this. <laughs> Next question. Okay, so the following questions are regarding your hair. Um, I love it. Is it, is it real? And what is your daily hair care routine? It, it is real. Uh, I have to point out a, a lot of, again, critics that don't like me, a lot of people said it's a bad perm. I have to say it's bad natural hair. That's great, not too bad. Um, th there's no daily routine. Uh, sometimes I wash it. <laughs> This morning I actually combed it out. 
that's about it. I don't, I don't, you know, whatever, whatever hair products are in the shower, that's what I use. I don't have any brand loyalty. Uh, I wish I had a better answer, but it's just, uh, just, it just grows out of my head. <laughs> Thanks for coming to Comic Con. I really appreciate you coming to Salt Lake. It's been, I mean, you're, I'm a huge fan. Thank you. Um, my question to you is when are you going to kick Troy Polamalu Troy off and let's make you the sponsor of Head and Shoulders already? <laughs> when are you going to be a sponsor of Head and Shoulders? <laughs> sponsor for Head and Shoulders. Um, spokesman for Head and Shoulders. Well, they'd have to make the offer first. <laughs> songs for the future, have you ever thought of doing a Back to the Future parody song? Oh god, please, yes. Please, please. <laughs> thought about it. I mean, that's one of my absolute favorite movies, and uh, I, mean, I love you more. That's always an option. I don't know. I can't rule it out. <laughs> Hi. Um, your music okay. videos are usually pretty memorable. I was wondering how involved you are in like the idea process and everything. I, I'm very involved. I, I've been directing most of my uh, uh, videos since the early 90s, and even before that, I was the creative, uh, I, I had a lot of creative input into them. Uh, in, in the 80s, I had my manager direct the videos because I kind of didn't want to be bothered taking the meetings and like, you know, telling the art department what color to paint the wall and that kind of stuff. But I was always the one that was storyboarding it out and figuring out the jokes. And I'd say, here, do this. Uh, and then just as time went on, I got a little bit more uh, uh, to be more of a control freak. So I found that by being a director, I had more you know, input and I was able to, you know, get things a little bit more close to whatever kind of crazy vision I had. So um, the, only, the only time I don't direct is, is when I'm uh, kind of farming out uh, projects to animators and things like that. Like for the, for the word crimes video, that was all uh, a guy named Jared Heather, uh, a brilliant guy that I found online. I, I was looking uh, online for people that did uh, kinetic typography, which is videos using basically words in creative ways. And uh, a lot of very talented people doing that. But this guy I thought had a great sense of comic timing. Uh, he was very skillful. Uh, and I, I just sought him out and uh, he sort of had disappeared. He did, he did a video for Jonathan Colton called Shop Back a few years back. And I thought, this, is, this guy's really good. And I tried to track him down. He hadn't tweeted in two years. He was basically off of social media, and I thought, did he die? What happened to this guy? But we tracked him down, and I just called him up and said, hey, it's Weird Al Yankovic, would you like to do my next video? And uh, he said yes, it, and that whole video was just him and a laptop and 500 hours of his work. And, and uh, you know, he, he, uh, we collaborated, he, he pitched ideas, we went back and forth on the phone, but that was, that was all him. Jumping on for a question, uh, what made you decide to jump into the director's chair? Then? You know, uh, this sounds extremely vain, and it is. Uh, but but kind of kind of what got me really wanting to direct was in the early '90s, uh, MTV started chironing the name of the director uh, <laughs> in the video, and you know, and and uh, I was thinking, well, it's my idea, so. I I want to get credit for this, so I thought, okay, well, uh, maybe my manager will let me take over <laughs> directing duties for a while. And I found out that I really liked it, so it was something that I took to, and then I started directing videos uh, for other people, uh, for, for, for Ben Foles and John Spencer Blue's explosion of Black Crows and Henson, uh, uh, and a few other people like that. Uh, did I say Henson? I meant Henson, sorry. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and, and Jeff Foxworthy, and, and it was, uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun. I like, I like spending other people's money. That's always a lot of fun. <laughs> ah, the days when MTV played music videos. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Hi, uh, big fan, and uh, my question is, how long does it usually take to film a music video, and do you have any say in the input? Yeah, as a director, you have a lot of say. Uh, sometimes uh, the budget will limit you as to how long you have to shoot something. Uh, it could be, you know, it could be a one-day shoot. I, th I think uh, the longest shoots would be 
three days. I think White Nerdy was about two and a half days. It was two full days, and we stole sh some shots uh, on the third day. Like, I remember, and we didn't have permits, don't tell anybody. We, uh, like, for the shot of me in front of the gap, it was basically, okay, let's get there on Sunday morning at 6.30, and I'll run out to the middle of the street and get the shot! No, 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 no! <laughs> Some, some shoots are very quick. The tacky video was, was like half a day, which it was all one shot, and we rehearsed wow. it in the morning, and then the celebrities all got there at like two o'clock, and they were done by four o'clock, and, and it was so fun. I just loved doing that video. I, I kind of wish we messed up more, because I wish I was able to like, you know, hang out and do the video with them all, all day, but we, they were quick. We did six takes, we used take number six, and that was it. song is Ben Rock Anthem. Yeah, I, yes, Love yes indeed. You got me suspended in fifth grade. So I'm so sorry. <laughs> Question. I'll write an over if you like. Question is, and nobody's asked about this, but the greatest show I think you've been on is Comedy Bang Bang. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And how was it working with Scott Ackerman, and did you have any say in the show, or any direction of the show, or did he kind of megalomaniac, that type of thing? Or? <laughs> Uh, uh, I, I loved uh, working with, with uh, Scott Ackerman, he, you know, he's, he's a good friend and, and I, I've always been a big fan of Comedy Bang Bang, so it was really a treat. I mean, I, I got off the road the, uh, the end of uh, uh, the tour after being on the road for like uh, four months solid, and the next morning I wake up to an email from Scott saying, hey, do you want to be the new band leader? And it's, it's not every day that I get offered to, to co-star on one of my favorite TV shows, so that was an easy, easy yes. Uh, and I, um, I, he would have allowed me input into the show, I'm sure, but I mean, the writing on the show is so good. And I trust those guys, and I just kind of follow their lead. Uh, and every single day on the set, I got to work with some of the funniest people in the world. Uh, it was very much my sense of humor. It's, it's not a super popular show, the ratings were always horrible. Um, but I think it was really popular among people who uh, really appreciate comedy, or at least that particular brand of comedy. It was a, a real, really a show for comedy nerds. Uh, and it was just something that I, I was very uh, happy to be a part of, and I, I, wish, I wish you could see all of the unaired shows that we're doing right now. Uh, we're, we're, still, we're still doing the show, we're just not, you know, shooting it on camera. We're just doing it in Scott's basement. <laughs> Hi, so I've read online that you're a pretty big Beatles fan, so I was wondering what your favorite Beatles album is and why. Oh gosh, uh, that, that's tough. Uh, maybe, maybe, oh gosh. I was going to say Revolver, I'm going to stick with Revolver, maybe. It's, it's, it's a tough, it's tough, I mean, you know, they're all good, it's, it's tough for me to pick. Uh, it's just got some of my favorite ones, some favorite songs. The White Album's good too, I know that, gosh. <laughs> I refuse to answer that. <laughs> I cannot. All right. Yes, hi. Um, I was wondering, I know you do some like hip hop songs, and I was wondering uh, if you'd ever do any with like Lil Wayne or Nicki Minaj, and if you like any of their songs, and if so, which ones? Um, yeah, I, I, I like them all. I, I haven't just gotten around to, to Nicki yet. Uh, I, I just, I'm somewhere along the line, uh, I'm sure. <laughs> sure, the planet will align, and I'll be able to do one of the one of those one of the parodies. I, I didn't get around to doing Anaconda. I'm very sorry about that, but <laughs> one of these days. One of these days. <laughs> is there a is there a, a John no, over here? <laughs> Hi. Um, is there a genre of music that you haven't touched yet that you want to try? Uh, I haven't done any Viking songs or whaling music. <laughs> genre eventually. Yeah, okay. Sounds good to me. Hi Al, thanks for coming oh. today. I was wondering uh, which popular recording artists, current or past, do you personally enjoy listening to? Oh my gosh, so many. Again, I, I hate to give a, a laundry list. Uh, I mean, some of, some of my favorite bands were uh, uh, like the, all the British Invasion bands, you know, from the 60s, the Beatles, the Stones, the Kinks, and the Who, and things like, things like that. And then, um, and then when the new wave was big, I was into Talking Heads and Evil and Oingo Boingo and B-52s. And in the, the 90s was all the, uh, the alternative bands and the garage bands. And, you know, I, again, I don't like to give you a huge list, but I, I like a lot of bands that are a little, a little quirky, not necessarily comedy or novelty groups. But, I mean, you know, I, I, I respect bands more when, they, when they're not shy about showing their sense of humor.
How much weight did he put on for fat? How much makeup did he put on? Oh, I was... No, that was makeup. I forgot about that. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, when, when I did the uh, the fat video, it was, uh, I, I think it was about three and a half hours of, of makeup uh, every time I put the uh, the outfit on. Uh, you know, this was in the 80s, back before, you know, nowadays we probably do it with CGI, but that was all real makeup. And there was one, there was one shot where you see my face literally expanding. And again, these days that would be an easy CGI trick, but back then what they did was they, they had these inflatable, they call them bladders, it was just like basically like balloons that they glued to my face, so it looked like my face when they were uninflated, but there were tubes that ran down the back of my neck and through my pants leg, and there were special effects people on the floor blowing through these tubes. <laughs> and literally blowing up my cheeks. And the take that we used, and they would do it a little bit each time, and we got three or four takes, and I said, that's good, that's good, now blow it all the way up until my head explodes. <laughs> So they literally did that. They, they kept blowing and blowing until my cheeks got bigger and bigger, and then they, they finally popped. So that was the take that we used. We used it all up until the point where my, my cheeks exploded. Now you're going to writing a parody with one concept, and then by the end turn it into totally something different. Could you give us an example of that? Uh, um, if I, th I think I understood your question, I, I don't think I've ever really done that, in, in that um, uh, whenever I have an idea for a song, uh, and if, I, I commit at the conceptual stage, like I, I, I rule out a lot of other options, but when I say, okay, I'm going to do this song, I've never gone halfway through it and then decided, oh, this idea is not working. The, the one, a couple times though, I've done pastiches, like original songs, where I, I got gotten halfway through it thinking it was going to be in somebody's style, and then decided, oh, this, this isn't really working, I'm going to do somebody else's style or make it more of a kind of a generic original. But, uh, but conceptually, I, I've always been able to kind of follow through on the original concept. Hi. Um, I know a couple of years ago you had some pushback about using the word spastic in your song, and I thought your response to that was very classy, your apology. and. I'm wondering about other, kind of jumping off what Jimmy asked you, I'm wondering about maybe if you've had other lyrics that you've had to change or that you've been challenged with or that even you got in trouble with. Well, I mean, there, there are some words that have taken on different kind of meanings over the years and, and, have, and have become you know, more offensive over the years. Um, I, I've used the word midget several times in my earlier recordings. I would not do that now. Uh, I feel very bad about spastic. I had no idea. In, in this country, in more, the, more North America, um, it basically means, you know, kind of a, kind of a goofy person. Uh, but in the UK and Australia, it has a very specific connotation uh, of somebody with a, an actual disease, which I was not aware of, and I was, I was horrified to learn that, and, and I, as you mentioned, I apologize for that. Uh, but you have to be very careful, especially when your stuff is going all around the world, to make sure that what you say, you know, doesn't mean something completely different that you're not aware of. The term mandatory fun has special meaning to uh, service members and veterans around the uh, world. And so I was curious about what kind of mandatory fun events you've encountered. <laughs> oh, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I, uh, there are, I've had a lot of mandatory events, and I, I tend to, to have fun at most things, so I don't know if anything that I've done, I don't feel like I was really forced to have fun at any point in my life. I just try to, to, to have it naturally. So I, I used the name mandatory fun just because I thought it was, it, it, was, it was a phrase that was sort of in our culture, and I'm told it was, it's something that's been used in the military a lot. Uh, and, and other, you know, some t t kind of uh, uh, executive applications for like various retreats that are put on. And I just like the idea of, of using the, the whole kind of like uh, totalitarian imagery for the album cover. So I just really like that phrase with, with the graphics and thought I could have, have, have a lot of fun with that. So I was wondering, uh, have 
any other like parody bands reached out to you, or have you ever reached out to anyone else, like say like the Lonely Islands or just X Party or Starbomb or anything like that? Uh, I, I'm fans of all those guys, and I, I've worked with uh, the Lonely Island. Uh, I, uh, in fact, I got to do a cameo in their movie Pop Star, uh, which was a lot of fun. Uh, I thought it was a great movie. I, you know. Uh, Rock-based comedies always have a tough time at the, at the box office. Even Spinal Tap, one of the greatest comedies of all time, didn't do that well at the box office. It's just a, it's just a hard thing. So um, I was happy to be in that. Um, you know, and, and those guys are good friends of mine, and, and I'm sure we'll be working on stuff in the future. Besides all of us, of course, what are some things you like about the state of Utah? <laughs> I like the shape. <laughs> Very rectilinear, and I appreciate that. <laughs> a lot of bullying issues growing up, so I appreciate that. Um, nobody's been talking about your band, and they're really good. Can you just talk to them? Absolutely. Yeah, I've, I've been very fortunate. I'm, I'm uh, kind of an anomaly in that you know I've been able to do what I do for you know, many years, like 35 years at this point, I guess, and I've had the same band the entire time. Um, I met my drummer, John Dorita Schwartz, on September 14th, 1980, and I remember that because that was the day that we did Another One Rides the Bus live on the Dr. Meno show. Uh, he happened to be there in the studio, and he was there for some unrelated reason, and I was just about to play another one rides the bus, and I said, hey, I, I need somebody to, to bang on my accordion case for percussion. And he said, well, I'm a drummer, I'll do it. And uh, then the song went viral, you know, back in the days before things went viral. Um, and we kind of kept in contact. I, I, uh, I called him on the phone from college and said, hey, this another one rides the bus thing is taking off. And he said, yeah, we should put a band together. Uh, so we did, we got Jim West on guitar, Steve J on bass, uh, and they've been with me since 1982. And uh, that's the core of the band. Ruben Valtiero on keyboards uh, got added in 1992, so he's the new guy. <laughs> he, gets, he gets picked on a lot. But yeah, they're, they're, you know, I feel very fortunate because not only are they amazing musicians that can play in any genre imaginable, they're all just like super nice guys. We get along really great. There's no behind the music kind of drama <laughs> on the road. Uh, I just feel very fortunate that they've, they've stuck with me all these years. In regards to music videos, which was your, what was the most fun to shoot, and which one was your favorite finished product? Um, I, I mentioned Tacky before. I, I'm going to go with that as the most fun to shoot, just because it was quick and easy, and it felt like it was over too, too soon. And it felt very low pressure, and everybody in it was amazing. Um, and in terms of and, and product, maybe, maybe white and nerdy, just because that felt like it was a lot more complex and uh, a lot of moving pieces. And uh, I was very happy with the way it turned out. And uh, let's face it, it's probably my most autobiographical video, so I kind of <laughs> worked on a lot of levels. Um, I'm a huge fan of your parents' work. Um, I am. You know, you, you, you have so many topics that you cover throughout all your songs. Is there a topic that you refuse to cover? Is there a topic to what? That you will not cover. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> I'm not saying I, that. I, 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 I can make some really... Uh, never mind. <laughs> Uh, obviously, there are topics I, I, I won't, won't cover. There's a, there's a certain line uh, 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 that you know of, of good taste and, and things that I think are a little probably too crude to uh, to write songs about. And not that I don't think those things are funny, but that's not necessarily the kind of humor I want to put out into the world. So uh, you can use your imagination. It's <laughs> a good question. We attended your Red Butte Gardens concert last summer. Thank you for coming to Utah. Pleasure, thank you. Somebody else already asked about the band, and I was going to ask that too, but I have another question regarding that performance, and that was that you were able to do so many costume changes and have so much energy throughout the entire concert. How, I understand that it's a very professional program you must have back behind the scenes. How many people do you have helping you 
with the costume changes, with all the band changes, etc.? Well, um, there is one uh, uh, wardrobe mistress, we call her, Rachel Romanowski, who's been with us for many years. She helps me with all the changes backstage. Uh, for some of the, the more complicated changes, like the fat suit or the uh, whatever I'm wearing for perform this way, whether it's the, uh, the octopus or the peacock or whatever it is, then we have one of the stage hands also help me getting into that. But it's, it's mostly just me, me and her backstage. Um, and then there's just, you know, everybody else that would be normally associated with a rock show. There's a monitor guy, there's a lighting guy, there's a sound guy, uh, stage manager, we have our truck drivers, we have our bus drivers, somebody doing merch, the tour manager. So, I mean, it's, it's a, a bit of an entourage on the road. Uh, we have one bus for the band, one bus for the crew. Um, and it's, it's, yeah, it's a lot of people to be dealing with. Uh, you know, sometimes I, I get envious of... Uh, uh, stand-up comedians that just go out and it's just them, them with a microphone, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, and, uh, and uh, it's, I, I would imagine that's a lot more lonely, but at the same time they don't have like, you know, 15 people on their payroll. <laughs> <laughs> then we have time for two more questions. Uh, with the talk of music videos earlier, one of the ones that stands out to me the most is Poker Face. And it's just a big collaboration of all these different styles. How long did it take you to make that? And where did you get the inspiration for each one of those? Well, uh, that was something that I was inspired by uh, an animator from Vancouver named Marv Newland. Uh, he's probably most famous for a short he did when he was very young called Bambi Meets Godzilla. And uh, he also came up with the idea of, of Anna Jam, where he would, would invite a bunch of his animator friends to uh, submit a piece of animation with, uh, which would begin and end with a very specific graphic. And then you'd tie them all together and make a whole piece out of it. And I thought, well, that would be kind of fun to do for, uh, for this, this kind of video because it's, it's a medley. Uh, so I thought a collection of animated pieces would be fun if I went to 12 different animators and they all had their own style and I gave them a project. So with, with next to no direction, I said, okay, this is your song, you get to do this 13 seconds of animation, uh, have fun. <laughs> and they would send me the pieces and I would tie them all together and it was, you know, very easy for me. <laughs> I basically just got to farm out the work and, and trust in their talent. I, I got to pick the animators, obviously. Um, and, but they, they did all the, all the heavy, heavy lifting, so it was, uh, that, was, <laughs> that was an easy one for me. And the last question, make it good. Pressure's on. It is. Uh, this is the first time I've actually seen you in person. And uh, I'm very Look at me. Thank you so much for your talent.